Excellent. Uh, well, thanks, Jerry, and uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, uh, Alan, you remain a very tough act to follow, of course, but I'll do I'll do my best and uh, uh, and welcome uh, welcome everybody here. I think um, it's tremendous for me. It's very exciting having been working pretty hard uh, on all these various things uh, to uh, to see so many people here with such an interest in this area. So I hope I can I can. Uh, I can retain your interest in the area and talk to you a little bit about uh, about what we've been doing in CSIRO and really just delve into this opportunity uh, of hydrogen energy a little bit further and hopefully uh, explain some of the uh, a little bit of the science, a little bit of the technology, and just what the opportunity really looks like. So I'll jump straight in. Um, what I'm what I'm going to do uh, is just talk a little bit more again around uh, why hydrogen is seen here and globally as an opportunity. Uh, and I'm going to divert. A, a little, a little, take, take a little, little diversion and look at some of the history of hydrogen energy because many people may not be aware that uh, it's been with us for a very, very long time. Uh, so, uh, so people have been thinking about this for a long time, but and, and I'm going to try and explain why it, why it's why it is different now, uh, again in in, uh, in in this iteration, uh, and some of the work we did in our roadmap uh, charting a potential future. Uh, and a potential opportunity for Australia in uh, in, um, in in hydrogen energy systems, and I'm going to touch a little bit a little bit towards the end on the, a passion of ours, of course, in CSIRO, uh, which is where R and D uh, and demonstration of, of uh, technology needs to go, or we think needs to go um, um, uh, in future. Uh, and we're very much working with the uh, National Hydrogen Strategy Task Force to sort of inform the R and D parts of that uh, that story. So. Why hydrogen? Why now? Well, let's go right back to the beginning and say what's the, really the challenge. And, and Alan touched on this very nicely. The challenge is that we have uh, an emissions profile which, at the moment, looks something like that. This is the uh, this is data from the in, in, uh, International Energy Agency, uh, who do a lot of scenario modelling, as does the uh, uh, IPCC group. Uh, so at the moment, we are headed to uh, along a business as usual trajectory, which looks like uh, four degrees four degrees temperature warming globally, uh, and. Um, and that's not really going to be very good for us, and I'll explain why that's not going to be good for us very briefly in a moment. Uh, the two degree scenario, which is still is still pretty pretty dramatic changes to the planet, is uh, is what needs that's what needs to happen to the amount of CO two in the atmosphere to secure that uh, that reduction in uh, in um, in uh, temperature. So a massive massive cut in the amount of carbon dioxide that's being emitted uh, in, on the planet, and to do that is going to take a lot of effort. Alan's talked talked about the scale of the challenge. It's an it is absolutely an opportunity, but it is going to need a lot of effort too. Uh, and so we need a lot of solutions. We need to throw everything at this problem, uh, and these are the uh, the IEA's perspectives on what uh, on what uh, what the options are, or what, or what the contributions can be from different technologies. Obviously, uh, uh, a lot of these things are being pursued very hard at the moment. Re renewables is probably an increasing wedge in that diagram. Uh, energy efficiency, things like uh, the lighting that we all use now, much more energy efficient than they were 10, 20 years ago. Uh, switching of fuels using things like hydrogen uh, and other fuels to reduce emissions. And of course, the nuclear and the CCS option, which remains a very, uh, a very, very large chunk of that uh, that 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 wedge diagram. CCS applied to fossil fuels to reduce the emissions from uh, from uh, that uh, that sort of technology. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, I, I guess in terms of what the implications are, uh, rather than trying to make future projections, which are uh, which are uh, always always uh, uh, difficult to, to, to substantiate. It's probably best to look back. Uh, so this is work that we did with the Bureau of Meteorology recently, published in uh, in late last year. Uh, so this is very much a a, a summary of what's happened uh, in recent years. So that graph there is is the is the actual uh, increase in uh, in um, in um, sea level. Uh, and you can see that since since the, the 1880s, there has been actually a re real measurable for multiple techniques increase in sea level uh, rise, uh, and um, and that is directly correlated to uh, to emissions reduction. You can't read those boxes there, but things like uh, what we've seen are increases in the frequency of uh, of, uh, of extreme heat events, sea levels rising, as I mentioned, etc. It, go it goes on. So this is historical data. This is not modelling of the future. This is actually what's happened. And and so it's reasonable to assume that that will continue to happen if we keep emitting at the rate we're going. So that's the uh, that's the challenge. Uh, Alan's already showed this diagram. Where does most of this emissions come from? It comes from the energy sector, that big grey uh, gray section there in that graph. And if we segment that, uh, uh, the, the, the majority of that comes from the electricity and heat that we use, both domestically and in industry, and other industrial uses, and transport, of course, very significant. So that's, that's, that's really the challenge, is uh, if we want to address emissions, we've got to do something about energy, as simple as that. Uh, 
some some chemistry, some some rather similar chemistry to uh, to what Alan showed you. This is this is a, this is I guess a, a, a summary of where we are now. So we are currently burning large amounts of things like coal or natural gas. The reactions are not too far away from each other. Now, if we take coal, we burn it in oxygen, incredibly efficient way of producing energy, uh, and it has powered the growth of uh, of, uh, of our of our economies globally uh, over many years. So we produce fantastic amounts of energy, but we produce carbon dioxide at the same time. And so if we want to uh, if we want to really um, really get, get get away from that carbon dioxide. We need to think about something that we could do that would uh, would uh, not involve producing CO2, and we wouldn't be here if we weren't talking about hydrogen as that fuel. So, as Alan has said, if we take hydrogen and we burn it in oxygen, or we react it in a fuel cell to produce energy, we, we can produce that quite efficiently as well. We produce water as the byproduct, and no carbon dioxide. So that really is the uh, the, the driver behind hydrogen as a uh, as, as a new energy carrier, a new energy medium for the planet. Uh, it's, it's the ability to use uh, to produce electricity and energy generally from uh, without producing carbon-based uh, um, uh, emissions. Um, and so once you have that energy, of course, you can start to think where you can use it. You can start thinking about where you use hydrogen as a, as a combustible media, uh, as an electricity production media. And once you've got all of those, uh, those uh, angles uh, worked out, you can see you can use it for heating, industrially and domestically, as I mentioned, transport, the electricity sector. Uh, we, most of the existing uh, uses of hydrogen, as I've already mentioned, are, are on the right-hand side of this diagram. So that's already extensively used as, a, as, a, as an industrial feedstock for many very important processes. Uh, and then, of course, in the middle there is the is the the big uh, new 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 concept in town, in a sense, which is uh, which is export. So, can we use hydrogen, or as as really the only uh, long range uh, um, renewable energy or low emissions energy transport medium? And that really is the the, the differentiating opportunity for countries like Australia, uh, because we're a long way away from where our markets are. We currently do this uh, for liquefied natural gas. Can we actually start thinking about hydrogen as a medium that we can we can put put on ships and move to the other parts of the world? So that's that's the opportunity there. Uh, and uh, as I say, hydrogen can, can be used in all of these applications. A little 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 journey through history. Uh, as I say, just trying to illustrate that uh, hydrogen is not really uh, not really a new uh, a new concept in terms of energy uh, sources. Uh, hydrogen really discovered by Henry Cavendish in the, in the 18th century, uh, named by Lavoisier in uh, in 1783. Um, the original discovery of electrolysis, which is the renewable pathway that, uh, that has now been developed commercially, was actually in, in 1800, again, a long time ago. Um, really importantly, hydrogen was used uh, as, a, as, a, as a gaseous energy source way back at the beginning of the 19th century. So the original, the original gas that we, we all use in our homes was actually, was actually a 50% hydrogen mixture that was made from gasification processes uh, of coal. Uh, and, and actually, uh, so it was mainly, it was really pioneered in the UK in about 1813. Australia actually was a, was a very early adopter of this technology, surprisingly, I discovered when I was looking into the history of this. So this is actually uh, the Australian Gaslight Company building in Sydney, still exists that building. It's a, it's a listed uh, heritage building, uh, and it's built uh, on, on the western side of Darling Harbour. That was actually the, pl the plant in, uh, in operation there, so it provided basically all of the, the lighting for Sydney. Uh, and of course, Mel Melbourne followed on soon after uh, uh, for, for many, many years until, until of course, the Bass Strait gas and, uh, uh, came online. So a very important... Uh, important uh, uh, um, contribution to science and to, well, to, to our economy. Uh, the Australian Gaslight Company, for those of you who haven't worked it out, that's AGL, that's what that is now. So, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it was a pioneer of, uh, of, uh, of, of industry as well, in a sense, in Australia. Uh, and again, there's, that, that, there's, that, there's some more chemistry there, just talking about some slightly more complex reactions that actually result in the... Um, the uh, production of energy from that uh, from that process, and that process is very much actually the basis for what uh, what uh, is the original the original technology for what's being uh, being built here in the Latrobe Valley now. So it's come a long way since then, but the, the, the basic chemistry is, is not too far away. Um, in 1874, uh, Jules Verne uh, made some uh, a, a, a scientific prophet, an author and scientific prophet in many areas. But he actually made an incredible, uh, uh, incredible observation about hydrogen, saying, "Saying yes, my friends, I believe that water will one day be employed as fuel. That hydrogen and oxygen, which constitute it, used singly or together, will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light of an, inten of an intensity which coal is not capable." Very prophetic words in the in the late 19th century. There, so, uh, so uh, yeah. Uh, um, um, yeah, uh, a real genius. 
Hydrogen really came online in a, in a big way uh, towards the beginning of the 20th century uh, when uh, the need for, particularly the need for ammonia, uh, both as a fertilizer and as an explosive uh, uh, um, feedstock, uh, drove the development of hydrogen industries, the, the development of steam methane reforming as a very high efficiency way of producing, producing hydrogen, which you can use in things like uh, uh, ammonia, ammonia synthesis. And most of us, uh, most of us uh, year, 10, year 10 chemistry students, of course, study the Harbour Bosch process as, a, as an example of an industrial catalytic process that, uh, that has really really changed the world actually in many ways the the ability to develop fertilizers using hydrogen from that, that approach has actually re revolutionized agriculture in many ways uh, coming right up to date now we're into the 20th century and beyond uh, uh, the, the, the the concepts of renewable hydrogen start to come online uh, um, actually a, a, a scientist working working at uh, working in Australia at the time coined the phrase this is John John Bokris, coined the phrase a hydrogen economy uh, uh, and uh, really, he, he was talking about how you're going to make, uh, how you're going to transport uh, um, energy from nuclear sources. But uh, but the, the basic uh, the basic concept is the same. If where, wherever your electricity is coming from, uh, you can use hydrogen. So he really coined the concept of hydrogen economy as being the uh, as being hydrogen being the glue in a new economy, which was low emissions. Uh, and of course, the big news really was uh, probably the space program in uh, in the 1950s and, and right through the Apollo program, right up to the current day, where the production of hydrogen, you know, pure hydrogen at a at scale, uh, and and also fuel cells. Actually, you know, fuel cells are a very important part of rocket to rocket to travel or space travel. Um, many of that was uh, uh, was was pioneered during the Apollo program for for uh, for getting astronauts uh, through space. Today, uh, moving right up to today, this is today's market. Uh, so uh, we're around about 20, 2018 here, and this 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 market is this is just the industrial, the current industrial use of hydrogen. So this is this is this is this is without any growth from a new energy system. You can see it's already a pretty big market. So there are people moving hydrogen, uh, using hydrogen in all parts of the world. You can see the market is dominated, still dominated by that ammonia production for fertilizer uh, uh, in the world. So around a half the world's market for hydrogen is currently fertilizers. Uh, a lot of a lot of hydrogen is used in refining processes for use, for, for for doing chemical reactions in in in, uh, in in petrochemical processing and some other fairly significant industries electronics metal glass and food uh, there as well so it's already it's already uh, the key point here is it's already uh, a very important feedstock for uh, for um, for industry uh, and so a lot of the problems and a lot of the concerns are actually uh, are actually already being looked at and already have been looked at for a long time not to say that not to say they don't need uh, new work in terms of uh, making this a much more widespread opportunity um, sorry let's go okay so why Australia then? So that's that's the global perspective in a sense. Uh, uh, there's, uh, there's but there is an Australian perspective. Alan's touched on it already. Uh, you have to start when you understand the opportunity. You have to understand understand where hydrogen comes from. Uh, so there are existing pathways, very mature pathways, as I've mentioned, for making hydrogen using fossil fuels. Uh, the problem there, of course, is you, you're going to generate CO2, uh, and so if you're going to if you're going to use these pathways, you really are going to have to have CCS uh, uh, working, functioning, uh, and of course we're very lucky. In in Australia, uh, again, you can't see this uh, this very clearly, but uh, we have a lot of projects and a lot of expertise. We, we are really amongst the world leaders in the science and technology of CCS here in Australia, uh, and so we are well positioned to uh, to get this technology going. And of course, we're doing quite a lot of work in, work on it in CSIRO as well, uh, with our partners at CO2, CLC, CarbonNet, and elsewhere. Um, so a lot of projects, uh, and one of the world's largest projects, the Gorgon project in in Western Australia, uh, coming online soon. Um, electrolysis, that's the renewable pathway using renewable electricity. Uh, um, again, you, 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 you need large amounts of renewable electricity to do that, so, so the build out of that is going to take time and effort, um, but, uh, but it, uh, the, the, the costs and technology are, are making that increasingly attractive as we move forward. And of course, the, the real story for Australia is the opportunity is our resources. So our resources are huge. So we've talked a bit about the, uh, the fantastic coal resource, the brown coal resource here in the Latrobe Valley. Uh, we, are, we are, as many will know, absolutely blessed. If you, if you come from Europe, as I do, and you look at the, uh, the scale of the resources that we have in this country, both renewable and fossil, it is just uh, gigantic. Uh, we have a tremendous uh, potential uh, uh, for, for, solar, for solar resources, uh, wind resources around our coastline, particularly in the south. Uh, and of course, the fossil fuel resources that we're currently uh, currently um, extracting and, and uh, exporting, uh, and uh, so so the the, the amount of energy we can use for making hydrogen is just uh, just gigantic in Australia. 
So why now? What's what's different this time? I've mentioned the history, uh, hydrogen's been around for quite a while. Uh, well, the answer is that that, uh, that when you look around the world, and, uh, and and there is a lot going on out there in the world, uh, the hydrogen industry is really underpinned by a mature mature technology. So you've got things like electrolysis now 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 moving towards industrial scale production. You've got uh, you've got the storage technologies, the uh, the transport technologies starting to come online. So the technology story uh, is moving much more from research through to through to uh, technology development in industry. Uh, you've got things like the cost of renewable energy dropping uh, uh, exponentially. So that's that's the price of silicon uh, solar cells uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, and you can see this incredible drop in the energy, the amount the amount it costs per uh, per uh, per megawatt of uh, of electrical energy has dropped dropped exponentially really uh, in, in 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 recent years. So that's uh, so the input for making hydrogen from uh, from renewable electricity is reducing in price dramatically. Uh, and you have the emergence, as we've heard, uh, of overseas markets. So you're starting to see countries that are that are existing massive importers of energy, fossil fuel energy, starting to look at options that they can uh, they can uh, they can decarbonize their economy and the planet, uh, based on uh, on global drivers like the Paris uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, and so markets are starting to emerge for low emissions energy. And uh, of course, the project here uh, uh, in in the Detroit Valley is 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 based on the, the that, that exact driver, uh, Japan's Japan's real third for, uh, for low emissions energy. So all of that means that the hydrogen industry narrative, the, 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 the things we talk about much more now, it's not so much about R&D and technology development, it's really about the priority now is how do we activate the markets? How do we activate the markets for hydrogen both locally and globally uh, that will allow this industry really to move forward? And so that's very much the, the, key, the key words from, from uh, the, uh, the work that we've been doing uh, recently. And so um, we in CSIRO, Alan, uh, many others have been doing a lot of work on trying to understand this opportunity and quantify the opportunity and, and chart paths forward for this, uh, this exciting new industry for Australia. Uh, we, in August 2018, published a national hydrogen roadmap where we really assessed and tried to look at some of the numbers uh, for the industry and what needs to happen with those numbers to get, uh, to get various uh, parts of the story uh, aligned. Uh, Alan was meanwhile working on the with the Coag Energy Council to, to explain the opportunity, and uh, Arena uh, uh, was looking at the uh, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. We're looking at the op the the export opportunity specifically. What is the scale, the potential scale for that industry? So, August uh, August last year was almost I can't believe it's a year ago now actually, but it was uh, it was a big month uh, with the release of all three of these reports. And these were all it was a, a great story for these reports because they were all interlinked. We were all talking to each other as we were developing them. So the uh, so we were really bouncing ideas around and making sure that and test, testing uh, testing all of the work that we were doing so uh, so a really good story of, of how you how you stop think and and then and then act uh, for Australia um, so a little bit more detail on the roadmap so that really the primary objective as I mentioned was to uh, assess the uh, the opportunity for for Australia uh, and that with the goal of helping industry and government uh, and and the community really to, to understand and uh, and look at uh, how they make decisions and investments around uh, around hydrogen uh, industry development, it was a, a secondary objective really, which was to bring together the the industry groups, the government, etc., uh, uh, which was uh, sort of starting to emerge in in, in pockets, but to, uh, wasn't at that stage wasn't really terribly well coordinated. So we felt by doing this piece of work, we would bring together all the players, and there would be a sort of a clear a clear forum. And a clear voice for for what the industry and and uh, research and government actually viewed as the future, uh, and uh, and so what we did we looked ac looked across all of those uh, different applications that I mentioned before. So electricity generation and storage, combustion, transport. So com combustion that is for heating, for industry and for uh, and for domestic uses, uh, for transport, the export opportunity, uh, and the existing, if you will, uh, growth of the existing opportunities as an industrial feedstock for uh, for uh, hydrogen. Uh, we looked across the value chain, so we looked at production, we looked at uh, the, uh, the storage and, tr and transport of hydrogen uh, and the utilisation opportunities. So we were trying to develop uh, cost models for all of these uh, different, uh, different aspects of hydrogen value chains, putting them all together to, to, to try and calculate numbers that would give us confidence about where the low-hanging fruit really was for hydrogen industry development in, uh, in Australia, uh, with a view to, uh, again, informing decision making. Um, so this was the this was the core the core of the roadmap. So if, if it's, it's quite a it's quite a voluminous document. Uh, if, if there was one part of the uh, one part of the hydrogen roadmap, which is available for download by the way, uh, that I would uh, focus on, it's this it's this this chart. Uh, and so this is where we started to say, okay, what what can the cost of hydrogen 
from and this is this is from electrolysis. So we spe we specific, specifically targeted electrolysis as a, as a as a an industry as a as a technology that was likely to reduce in cost for hydrogen production. So this is what the cost of hydrogen from electrolysis uh, we we felt would do in the next uh, ten to twenty years. And when when I say we we felt it was it was very much gathered from information from the industry that works in this space to say, you know, how, how, far, how far can we push down the cost of hydrogen using some of these renewable energy based technologies. And so uh, that's where we are now. That's, our, uh, that's our, current, our current estimate for where we are, around about $5.70 uh, a kilogram of hydrogen. Uh, and we can see that uh, we, we projected the, uh, the, uh, the, the cost of that hydrogen to drop to around about $2.50 a kilo over the next 10 years. And so that's, that's, that gives us a guideline for where we think uh, it, it, hydrogen can be used in industry. So what we then did was to say, given, given that cost projection, where does the cost of hydrogen need to be for it to displace existing uh, uh, feedstocks and energy sources in industry? Um, we, and we did that based on all of the different applications that, we, that I mentioned earlier. So we started off by looking at, uh, looking at things in the top zone. So in the top zone, anything above that line uh, now, above and to the left, means that uh, pretty much the applications are ready to go uh, now or soon uh, in terms of hydrogen cost alone. Uh, and we go, as we go into the middle zone, um, where, where, where it's still above the line, but not, not, not above the line that's there now, uh, that's, that's the stuff that can come online in the near future. And below the line, there's some, something's got to happen. So change it, uh, costs have got to drop even further, uh, or, uh, or, um, cost, uh, or, or efficiencies have got to go up. So things like transport, the reason you see things like the Toyota Mirai outside uh, now, transport uh, is, is actually pretty close to being economic from a hydrogen perspective, uh, uh, hydrogen, a hydrogen production perspective right now. Uh, so, uh, so, so the cost of hydrogen for those applications, you're essentially displacing liquid fuels, expensive liquid fuels like, like petrol. Uh, so hydrogen is actually pretty competitive on a cost basis uh, for, uh, for, the, for the fuel itself. That is not to say it's ready to go right now as an industry because there are still big barriers around infrastructure. So uh, if you want to have a widespread use of hydrogen vehicles, you're going to need uh, a widespread deployment of, uh, of, um, of uh, refueling infrastructure. So that's, 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 still a, that's still a big barrier there for that technology, but with will and determination, et cetera, uh, we can we can uh, start to deploy those, and a lot of people now are really looking at deployment of those fuels fuels fueling systems. Uh, down here, we start seeing things which are sort of not quite not quite economic yet from a uh, from a uh, from purely from a hydrogen cost perspective, but th but they're going to be close. And you can see there in the middle of that, around about 2025, if if we can get hydrogen costs down to that two dollars fifty. Uh, hydrogen production costs down to that two dollars fifty a kilo level. Uh, that's when that's when the export opportunity really comes online, and that's really what the core of this uh, of the of the project here in uh, here in Victoria is: is to try and look at look at look at where we can uh, we can bring those costs down and get that uh, get get ready for that uh, that that new eventuality. Uh, coming, coming later, uh, so some of the things w w which are getting more challenging, so things like grid firming services uh, and synthetic fuels, uh, there you're starting to displace very cheap feedstocks so it becomes harder. You know, if you're just displacing natural gas, even though natural gas feels like it's very expensive uh, at the moment here, uh, it's actually, it's actually as, a, as an energy source it's not, uh, and consequently the cost of hydrogen has to be that much lower to displace things like natural gas from, uh, from, uh, from utilisation. So that some, something's got to happen in some of these areas to, to get uh, to get either the either the costs have got to go up uh, of the existing incumbents, or the, the cost of hydrogen has got to come down to, 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 to get to parity, and that's that's not to say it can't happen, but it just needs uh, it needs more work. And then residential heat again, you're uh, you're displacing then residential heat, you're displacing natural gas typically, and uh, or, or or electricity uh, that we currently use. So again, the costs have to be pretty low to allow hydrogen. So that really was the core of the roadmap. There's a lot of analysis that sits behind that, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, thinking and uh, an assessment and industry discussion that lies behind that. And uh, you know, I, I really encourage you to have a have a good look at that uh, if you're interested to read further. That's it's um it's quite useful. Um, in terms of export, I think uh, we've heard this already. Uh, we've got we've got all the potential. We've got the resources. Uh, we've got the skills. We've got existing track record with trade partnerships. You know, an LNG an LNG industry that already does this, uh, and uh, and so the opportunity for Australia uh, and regional proximity to some of our uh, to some of the people the markets that are really emerging in this area uh, are there for the taking. So as as Alan says, it is a it is a race, but we are well positioned if we uh, if we if we if we if we get off the blocks pretty quick. So. It's been quite a bit of work uh, since August last year. Last, last year, uh, um, it really uh, different states and states and federal 
uh, reports and strategies coming out, and uh, you know many of us have been involved in many of these uh, these uh, these pieces of work. Uh, so uh, we've had the Queensland strategy in May, uh, WA strategy just uh, just last month, uh, the National Hydrogen Strategy that Alan's leading coming coming online uh, towards uh, towards uh, the end of the year. Um, so a lot of thinking. Uh, it's it is actually a good to see a strategic approach being uh, being adopted to, to developing a new industry, a new new energy system in particular. So uh, a lot of a lot of deep thought uh, and um, and activity. We're as I mentioned, we're we're uh, we're working right now on really trying to look at the research and development opportunities for Australia for Australian institutions to to really contribute to this uh, this industry development. Um, there is a lot of actual practical on the ground work going on as well. So, uh, so there is a, there are a lot of projects. I've got this is this is this is the current and it's probably changes daily. This, but this is a current uh, a description of all the different demonstration projects that are going on around Australia. Uh, the Hesk project here in here in the Trove Valley, of course, a, a real a real highlight in terms certainly in terms of the scale of this project uh, uh, is. Um, is uh, is a big one, uh, but lots and lots of uh, demonstrations of uh, of uh, transport systems, uh, gas into ga hydrogen gas into gas network systems, uh, ammonia production uh, here and here. So uh, so it is actually a national. It is already a national effort that's uh, that's that's uh, getting going. So uh, so those demonstration projects can be critical to uh, really really um, allow the industry to grow. Um, I'll probably just zip through this. I think there are, there are key technologies. Uh, I think the, if, if I was to look at the one area that really needs the biggest amount of work, it's how it is how you how you move how you move hydrogen around in different ways, uh, using uh, um, uh, and, and reduce the cost of doing that because it is it is still not cheap to do that at the moment. So I think that's a, that's a key area that's going to going to need more work. And the Hess project here, which is developing liquid hydrogen as a, as a, as a carrier, is um, is of course uh, really targeting that. Um, our role, uh, so I think uh, just, just as a sort of a, an advert for CSIRO, what, so what we're really doing in this area, we're developing thinking, uh, trying to inform decision making, we're developing technologies that, uh, that can underpin the industry, uh, and we're developing industry partnerships that are allowing, allowing the commercialisation of Australian technology uh, in Australia to, to really enable, enable this industry. Um, I've mentioned the R&D opportunities report, which is coming soon. Um, okay, so summary and conclusions, really. I think hopefully, hopefully, Alan and myself and others have showed you the technology readiness is there. Uh, it's an opportunity to maximise the value of Australia's resources, um, and there are global markets coming, which with de decarbonisation as a priority. Uh, that market activation really is the next step, uh, and that's going to need strategy. It's going to need policy settings. It's going to need industry investment, and it's going to need industry scale up. So there's a, there's a there's a huge uh, huge uh, opportunity and a huge task ahead of us, uh, but I think we are up to it. Um, from an R&D perspective, R&D really uh, can underpin the, the growth of all of the aspects of the, of the value chains by lowering costs, uh, building scale, etc. So, uh, so we, we're, we're pretty excited about the opportunity that the birth of a new industry for Australia can have on the R&D sector as well. Um, and so we're, we're really appealing to our partners to say, let's, let's get behind this and really uh, make this happen as well. And that was all I had to say. Thank you.